welcome to those of you that are in the room and those of you that are joining us online. I want to say a special thank you to Chib for leading us. He and Lindsay did a great job this morning and our team, our musicians. Um, we had a couple people that had to call in sick this morning, and man, I just think they did a great job leading us. And uh, thank you so much, guys, for your faithfulness. Thank our tech team as well. Uh, these guys are behind the scenes, and you never really notice them until something goes wrong. And uh, then we're like, what in the world are they doing? But these guys do a great job. Let's give all these guys a hand. Thank you. Well, I want you to pray this with me before we get started today. And I want you to pray it out loud. Just repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to me today and help me to change my thinking according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Online and in the room, if you'll pray that prayer and you'll mean it. Here's what God says. He said, my word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that for which I sent it. And the word of God, the Bible tells us that it is alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And when we will listen to it, it will change us. Notice I ask you to pray, God, change my thinking. Do you know that that is the definition of the word repentance? To repent means to change the way you think. It means to think like God. It means to think God's way. And that, you know, many of us, we grew up uh, seeing in our mind at least a long bony finger pointing at us, telling us turn or burn and that everything that we do is bad. Better burn that devil's music. And we'd have, you know, bonfires where we'd burn our uh, rock CDs and cassettes and, uh, and records and so forth. And so when we think of the word repent, that's what we think of. But that's not what the word repent means. The word repent, yes, it means to make a change of direction, to turn around, but it is one of the most beautiful and wonderful gifts that God gives to believers, to be able to change your thinking. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, uh, overcoming stinking thinking. Anybody ever been guilty of stinking thinking? Like, you know, I heard about a grandpa, his grandkids played a, a joke on him. He was taking a nap on the couch, as grandpas do. And uh, he was kind of leaned back, snoring, and his grandkids took some stinky cheese and rubbed it in his mustache. When well, he woke up, he got smell. He's, man, this room stinks. And he went into the next room. He goes, man, I think this whole house stinks. And he went outside and he goes, man, I think the whole world stinks. And I think that's how we live sometimes. We're guilty of stinking thinking. You are what you think. And you can overcome that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Once again, this is not a motivational talk where I'm going to sell you some CDs at the end of the program. Or for four easy payments, you can get my videos of how to, you know, lift your... No, that's not what this is. This is from the Word of God, how we overcome the wrong way of thinking. And the Bible is very clear in what we're going to read today, that there is a way for us to do this. And so I want us to read together. We've been going through the book of Colossians this summer, and here we are going to continue. Uh, and today, Paul shows us that right thinking leads to right living. I want you to think about that statement. Right thinking leads to right living. In fact, I want us to say that together. Ready, everybody, together. Right thinking leads to right living. You see, when you think right, you're going to live right. When you think differently, you're going to live differently. When you think in the wrong way, you're going to live the wrong way. And so Paul shows us very simply how to do this. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, it says, if then you have been raised with Christ, what does that mean? Well, earlier in the book he talks about being raised with Christ is putting your faith in him. You've been saved. God has 
uh, you've been born again, you've been transformed, you are a Christian now. So if you've been saved, if you've been uh, a person that has become a Christian. If you put your faith in him, he said you're raised with him. So if you've done that, and by the way, that would include, I'm assuming most of you in the room today, many of you watching online, if you've put your faith in Christ, if you claim the name of Jesus, he said, then seek those things which are above. So if you're a believer, seek the things that are above. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain that in a moment. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Um, And he goes on, he says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and he's talking about dying to your sins. You've died in Christ so that you could become alive you, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, uh, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So what does he mean by thinking about things above? Does it mean that you are so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? No, that's not what that means. It doesn't mean that you forget about your job or your family or your football season or school or your kids, it doesn't mean that. It means that we are to think in a way, notice how Paul wrote this. He said, we're to think about things above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. That is a position of power. That is a position of ruling. That is a position that Jesus is in, which gives us the idea that one day we're gonna be with him And so the idea of thinking about things that are above is like thinking about what it's going to be like when you are with Christ, when you are with God, when you're in heaven. But don't get it wrong. It doesn't mean that you forget about things that you're doing here. But I think literally what it means is that we are to think like God is with us. Think about things that are above. Think about the fact that Jesus has conquered. Jesus is at the right hand of God. Think that way. I went to college, um, my undergraduate, and I did seminary and so forth. But my first year of college, I went to a Christian college, and uh, I lived in the dorm. That was an ungodly experience. I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, you talking about smelly, a men's dorm is a, one of the smelliest places on earth. Well, anyway, I had two roommates my freshman year. Uh, one was Al, and Al was, uh, he was a new Christian, okay? Uh, his parents had uh, come over from Cuba, and they were first-generation Americans. Al was a first-generation uh, American born here, uh, and his family was... I'll say a little non-traditional. Okay, and I, let me explain it. Al thought it would be a good idea that the night before he went to a Christian college, because he knew that the rules of the Christian college is that he couldn't do the things that he normally did, he smoked all of his weed the night before he came to Christian college. Okay, so that's one of my roommates, all right? The other roommate was a guy named Mike, and Mike was one of these guys that was so pious and so spiritual, when you were around him, you wanted to punch him. You you know what I'm saying? You ever been around people like that? Just acted as if there was nothing really here on this earth. He had, he was, Mike was engaged and he said this. Um, He said, guys, my fiance and I, we do not desire to have a physical relationship We just desire to have a spiritual relationship. And my pot-smoking Christian roommate said, are you out of your freaking mind? And so here you have two extremes. One guy, he thought that it would be a good idea to smoke all of his pot before he came to Christian college the next day. The other guy was engaged, and he's like, I'm not worried about the physical. I'm just worried about the spiritual. Well, the truth of the matter is neither of those is what Paul's talking about. He's not saying 
that you should be so earthly minded that you're no, uh, or no, so heavenly minded you're of no earthly good, pretending as if this doesn't exist. He's also not saying that you don't live your life as if, you know, that God doesn't want to have a relationship with you, that there are not some things that you need to do. So what is he saying? Well, here's the first thing, and I want you to, I want you to think about this that if you're going to overcome stinking thinking, the wrong kind of thinking, the number one thing you do is you meditate on God's promises. You meditate on God's promises. That's what he's saying. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You meditate on the Word of God. This idea of of seeking God and and setting your mind, uh, it means to set your desire or to have an experience so powerful that you're consumed with it. You ever been consumed by something? Just this past week, I mowed my grass out in the hot sun, and man, I was so thirsty. And more than I wanted anything else in the world at that moment, you know what I wanted? Some ice cold water. That's what I wanted. And I got me, a, I not just one big cup, but I drank three big cups of ice cold water. Why? I desired it. I was consumed with getting it. And we've all been there with different things in our life. But that is the idea of what Paul is talking about here when he writes and says, set your mind set your mind, be determined, be consumed with this. When I was in high school, I was consumed with some things. Um, One thing I was consumed with was sports. I played uh, all the sports that my school offered uh, for for guys. And uh, so I uh, wanted to clarify that. We didn't play girl sports. But nevertheless, I was um, on the boys' teams. And uh, I was consumed particularly basketball. That was my sport, love basketball. And I could say that as a teenage boy, I was consumed with that. I, I worked out, I pursued it, I went to camps. I, I wanted to get better at it. I was also consumed with food uh, when I was a teenage boy. Is there anything that eats more than a teenage boy? I don't think there is. I consumed so much food, I think it embarrassed my family but I'm pretty sure it broke my family because I ate so much. Now, I had a desire, okay? I was pursuing this. This is what Paul's saying. You got to claim, you got to meditate on, you got to pursue the promises of God. That's what he's saying. Listen to Philippians 3, 12 to 14. This is Paul writing again. He said, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I've made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert on all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal. Do you get the idea that Paul was, he would have fit into this church. We say things like, this is the perfect place for imperfect people. Paul said, I don't have it all together. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the most influential Christian in world history. He's responsible for more churches being started than anyone in the world. He wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. He said, I don't have it all together. I love the fact that this was a man that was a great Christian, but he admitted, you know what? I don't have it all together. I'm not perfect. But he said, one thing I do, I got my eye on the goal. And I'm going for it. Man, we need some Christians that are going to live that way. I'm not perfect. Yeah, I blow it from time to time. But you know what? I may not be everything I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And thank God that I'm not, gonna, that I'm not what I'm going to be one day. This is what God says. That you and I need to be ones that keep our eye on the goal. He said, where God is beckoning beckoning us onward to Jesus, I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. Can I tell you, if you don't overcome stinking thinking, once again, I'm not talking about positive thinking versus negative thinking. There are people that are positive by nature. 
okay? I am a glass half full kind of person. I normally see the good. My dad, on the other hand, he is more of a negative person. He's a glass half empty kind of guy, all right? Now, my dad will say, well, I'm not negative. I'm just realistic, all right? So he's like, if anything can grow, go wrong, it will go wrong. I mean, there you go, dad. You're proving my point, all right? So, but, so he's not talking about personality types. There's some of you that have more of a positive outlook, and some of you have more of a negative outlook by nature, okay? But what he's talking about is how we speak and how we process the promises that God has given to us. Remember, he's saying meditate on the promises of God. Set your mind on things above. Process that, because Paul said, he said, I am running. There is no turning back. I am running. You know what we need? We need some Christians that are going to live that way and say, I am not turning back. I am not turning back. Look, it's obvious since COVID that all churches, for the most part, don't have as many people in them as they used to. Our church certainly doesn't. But let me tell you something. Just because a church is smaller does not mean it can't be stronger. Amen. Listen, if we have Christians, if we have people that say, I'm not turning back. God's put me in this race, and I'm going to continue. I'm going to cross the finish line. If we have people that will do that, then we will be a stronger church no matter the size, and we'll be able to fulfill God's mission for us here on this earth. And that's what God wants us to do. We've got to overcome stinking thinking. He said, to set our minds on things above. It means to keep giving serious consideration. Uh, by the way, when he says that Christ is on the throne, that shows us that we don't have to have thinking that is devoid of reality or thinking that's just pretend, okay? Do you know what in the Old Testament the idea of being positioned to the right hand of the Father, it meant a position of power and of one who had conquered. Listen to um, Exodus 15, 6. It says, your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. It dashes the enemy to pieces. You see, God says, we think about Jesus we think about where he is, not pretending to be so spiritually minded. And once again, I have my doubts about people that are like that, you know, that they never see anything bad in the world, that no matter what happens, they're always, praise Jesus. Now, I believe you should praise Jesus for everything, but if I hit my finger with a hammer, I just want you to know, I'm not perfect, okay? And I don't say praise Jesus. I'm not going to tell you what I say. You may not let me be the pastor anymore if I tell you that. But the fact of the matter is that when we declare the promises of God, trusting in God, it changes our thinking. Why? Because Jesus conquers the enemy. That's what it said there in, in Exodus, that God is on his throne. It's glorious in power. And he will dash the enemy to pieces. He'll dash the enemy to pieces. God wants to crush your enemies. And by enemies, I'm not talking about your next door neighbor that blows his grass clippings onto your driveway. We're talking about the devil of hell. We're talking about the real enemy. We're talking about those invisible powers that we battle against that Paul wrote in Ephesians, we got to put on the whole armor of God so we can withstand the devil's schemes. Did you know the devil has schemes? He wants you to be guilty of the wrong kind of thinking. He wants you to think that there is no hope. You ever just look around and figure out from the circumstances that there's not much hope. The Bible is full of stories like that. I think of the children of Israel as they had been delivered from slavery in Egypt and Moses had led them out and, and they were between a mountain on either side and the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army with bad intentions behind them. 
You know what the reality was? They were in trouble. The reality was there was no escape. But I want you to understand when we meditate on the promises of God, God promises to be with us. God promises to deliver us. And there is no mountain big enough. There is no sea deep enough. There is no army strong enough to keep you from fulfilling God's promise for your life if you will trust him. Now, let me just say this. Listen. Listen. God doesn't want you to ignore facts. The Israelites, they were looking around. They said, hey, we're in trouble. There are times that you need to acknowledge reality, that you're in trouble. Sometimes you're in trouble with your marriage. Sometimes you're in trouble with your finances. Sometimes you're in trouble with your kids. And I could go down a list, but that's not my purpose here. But God doesn't want us to deny the facts. But understand this. Faith always trumps facts. Faith in God's promises always, always, always will trump the trouble that you are in. That's why Paul said, I'm not looking back. I've got in this race and I am not looking back. Aren't you glad that when Jesus is with us, we don't have to look back? We don't have to quit. We don't have to give in. We don't have to stop. Why? Because it starts with our thinking. And the way that your thinking has changed, listen, it's not through watching, you know, self-help stuff on YouTube. It's not even from reading a good book. No, nothing wrong with those things. But listen, that's not what God is talking about. It starts with our faith in the Word of God, the promises of God. So he says, I am to meditate on God's promises. You want your mind to change. You want to be transformed in your thinking. You want to stop hating life, living in depression, living without hope thinking that there's no way out, you want to stop doing that, then you've got to start meditating on the promises of God. And by the way, sometimes God's promises don't make any sense. You are aware of that, right? Some things that the Bible says don't make sense, in our way of thinking at least. Remember when Jesus was walking on the water, the disciples were in the boat, the storm was raging. The sea was about to destroy their little, little boat, their ship. They saw Jesus walking on the water. They panicked. Oh, no, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, no, it's I. Just don't be afraid. And Peter, and I, and I love this guy. We don't give him enough credit. A lot of times people talk about how he failed. He's the only one that got out of the freaking boat, all right? He didn't fail. He said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. Come on. Come on. And Peter became the second person in world history to walk on water. Got out of the boat. Started walking toward Jesus. Now, we know the story. He got his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink. And he did the smart thing that you and I need to do. He prayed in that moment of his problem they didn't pray a long prayer. He just said three words, Lord, save me. And you know, sometimes that's exactly enough. And, and when we live by the promises of God, God empowers us to do what we could not do on our own. And I promise you, when you try to live your life on your own, in your own power, in your own strength, there's no hope. But when you me meditate on the promises of God and understand that it's faith that makes the difference, then my friend, you too can get out of the boat and walk on water. And so that's what God tells us. Here's the second thing we do, and we'll see that from reading the next part of the, these verses. He said, put to death, therefore. And he said, meditate on the things above. But put to death some stuff. Sometimes it's not enough just to think right. It begins there. Sometimes you got to take some action. 
He said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And by that, he's talking about sinful. And then he goes through this whole list, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. And and he's talking about sensual, sensuous types of things. And by the way, sex is not wrong. God invented it. But sex is to be inside a marriage of a man and a woman married to each other. That's God's plan. When you deviate from that, you're not living by God's plan. He says, uh, and covetousness, that's desiring what you don't have, not a desire to better yourself, not this this overwhelming desire. You see what somebody else has and you, ah, I want that. It's covetousness. You covet. I often wondered up until a few years ago why that was included in the Ten Commandments. I mean, he's got some big ones in there. No idols, worship only God, don't murder anybody, don't tell lies in court, don't, don't be a liar, don't steal, don't commit. A, I mean, look, those are big ones. And, and I get that, but covetousness? Why does he put that? Because the truth is, the other nine spring out of that 10th one. We covet. We covet. The reason people don't worship God is they covet power. They covet the power for themselves or they covet more for themselves. They think, well, if I give God this time, then I'm not going to have that time. They covet. They, they covet uh, worshiping idols that are not God. They covet. What is it they covet? Well, just like with the Israelites, you read the Old Testament, they coveted power and they coveted success and they coveted money and they coveted prosperity, not realizing that the God that they were supposed to be worshiping was the only one that could provide that for them. But we covet. Why do we mistreat our parents? Why do we not honor them? Because we covet our own way, our own desire to be able to be in charge of our own life. Why do we steal? We covet. Why do we kill? We covet. Why do we commit adultery? We covet. Why do we lie? We covet. And so he includes this in this list, which I find very interesting. He said, he talked about all these desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Now, once again, what is God's wrath coming for us? Coming to judge sin. But thank God, our sin was judged on the cross. Jesus died in our place. So, and he was saying, you used to be this way, but you're no longer under this condemnation. Although some of them, even though they were Christians, were still doing some of these things. And so he's saying, you got to change your thinking. And then he says, but now you must put them all away. So he included these sexual sins and covetousness. And then he goes to talk about something else. He says, anger wrath, malice, slander. Oh, honey, did you hear? Did you hear what she did? Now, I'm not gossiping. I just want you to pray. You're a liar (laughs) is what you are. You're just spreading gossip. He said, don't do that. Obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So he says, because you now have a new image in you, a new person, you got the old self, but you got the new self now. Uh, He said here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And he's basically saying, the cross, at the foot of the cross, all is level. It doesn't mean there's no differences in any of us. He's saying that when it comes to Christ and Christ's love and our access to God, there is no difference. There are no spiritual superheroes. You have access to God just as much as I do as a pastor. Now, there are some people that believe that preachers somehow know that have like the bat line to heaven, you know, the hot phone to heaven and that they can't really talk to God. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting other people to pray for you, but you can pray too. Now, what, what does he say, number two? We're to claim God's deliverance. 
That's what he's saying. First of all, we've got to believe in his promises, and then we claim his deliverance. What he was saying here is that Christ is a, is a God, a Lord, who will deliver you if you ask him, if you come to him. The idea of killing off what is earthly calls to mind the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he says that when you trust him, he will deliver you. Now I want you to see what he was delivering us from. Number one was personal habits. He talked about this whole list of sins. And there are some people that believe that there is no hope for them. Well, that's just what I do. There's no hope for me. I'm always going to be that way. That's not true. You can be delivered. Uh, then he talks about destructive emotions, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander. There are a lot of people that have destructive emotions. It is not just in anger. Sometimes it's in discouragement and depression. Destructive. Or, or the kind of emotions that are, how do I describe this? Uh, you project onto other people. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I wish I had something like that. Must be nice. You just kind of project that on somebody else. And what you're saying is, you really don't deserve that, but I do. I wish I had it, right? I learned a long time ago that you can't reason with people like that. I used to be like, you know, because God had blessed me with some things, I would be like, you know, if I had a, something, I'd be, oh, you know, somebody gave me this. Or, you know, I got this on sale, and I'd go through this whole thing about how much I'd saved and how much it didn't cost me. I quit doing that, all right, because I realized that people that are ha having those destructive emotions like that, there's no helping them. So now if they say something like, must be nice, I say, sure is. Thank God, you know. But he will deliver us from personal habits. He will deliver us from destructive emotions. And he will deliver us in our personal relationships. He said, don't lie to one another. We lie to protect ourselves. We lie to project that we're something that we're not. I can't say that without mentioning social media, can I? I mean, the truth is there's more lies being told in the world today than ever in the history of the world. Why? Because of social media. One of the funniest that I ever saw or read about was this woman that had, I don't know, many, many followers, hundreds of thousands of followers, and she was like the beach life, living the beach life or whatever. And turns out somebody ratted her out. She didn't go to the beach at all. She had a sandbox out behind her apartment. And that's where she took all of her photos. <laughs> and people, like hundreds of thousands of people were following her. Must be nice. Yeah, it is. And uh, she was lying. Now, why do I say that? Well, because God wants us to know that in our personal relationships, we can be real. Listen to what Romans 6, 13 says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. That would include your mind. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Use all of it. Can you use your job to bring glory to God? Absolutely. Can you use your hobbies to bring glory to God? You should. Can you use, when you're in high school, can you use studying? Can you use uh, pursuing a sport for the glory of God? Absolutely. Now, I know this is an old movie, but it's a great illustration. If you ever saw the movie Chariots of Fire, it's about a man that uh, he was from Great Britain and he was a Christian and he ran. And long story short, he ended up winning in the Olympics. And someone was interviewing him one time about what he felt when he ran. And he said this, and I'll never forget this line in the movie. He said, when I run, I feel his pleasure talking about God. And you know what that man had discovered? That you can bring glory to God with your life. 
You don't bring glory to God just by going to church. Now, should you go to church? Yes. But that's not how you bring the greatest glory to God. How you bring the greatest glory to God is letting God transform your thinking. You begin to meditate on God's promises and you give, begin to claim his deliverance in your life. He will deliver you. And when you begin to understand that, you can bring glory to God by the things that you do in this life and you can feel his pleasure. Well, here's the last thing. He said, put on them. So notice what he said. He said, you gotta think about some things. Then you gotta put on, he uses a metaphor of like putting on a, a coat or some pads to play football. You put it on. You ever notice that if you're going to watch a football game, whether it's peewee, high school, college, or professional, there's one thing that they all do. They wear pads. They wear a uniform. They put it on. Why? To be prepared, to be protected. God says, you got to put some stuff on. That's what we've got to do. And then he says, you got to put some stuff off. So he says, here's what you put on. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness. Did you know you had to put on kindness? I know I have to. It's not my natural go-to move. My wife has incredible compassion, both spiritually and naturally. It comes to her. I have to work at it, all right? She can see a kitten commercial and cry and feel empathy. And I can see a disaster and say, sucks to be you. You know, that's my natural, you know. But we put it on. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. You may not feel like you can forgive, but you can. He said, you put it on. You take it up. Just like putting on your pads to play a football game. You got to get ready. You, you do it. He says, uh, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, he's talking about the things you say, okay? He said you put on some things, you take off some things. And he said you can put on these things. And by doing this, notice how he talks about our words. We sing we admonish each other. And you think that the music is just a side part of the service? It's not. It is a major part of the service, just like the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Why? Because we're admonishing each other. We're encouraging one another. We're lifting each other up. We're praising God. We're using wisdom and songs and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And you know what? It causes us to be thankful. That's what he says. So what's the last thing you do? You want to transform your thinking? You declare God's word over your life. Declare it. You meditate on the word of God. Now, it's one thing to, I do that almost every day. I have a whole list of verses that I'll go through and I memorize and I read them and I declare it over my life by faith. And you say, why do you do that? Well, because I'm, I know that God fills me up but I'm like, uh, I'm not like a big metal bucket. I'm like a wicker basket. When God fills me up, I leak out. And I can leave church being full. And I promise you by Monday morning, I've leaked out a little bit. And you know what you and I need to do? We need to learn to keep on filling up and keep on filling up and keep on filling up. Because when we do... We're going to be able to declare God's word over our life. When you get to that point where you're not just meditating on the fact that God promises to be with you, but you declare it. I believe, God, that you're with me. 
I believe you promise you never leave me or forsake me. And I believe that even though I am in pain, you are with me right now. There's a difference between saying you believe it and actually declaring it. And so God wants you to declare it over your life. Jesus consistently asked people, what do you think? What do you think? What do you want? You see, our thinking can be clouded by our circumstances, or it can be clear through faith. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brothers and sisters, don't think like children. When it comes to evil, be like babies, but think like mature people. God wants you to be a mature thinker. Ephesians 4, 23, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. That's talking about your attitude. Proverbs 18, 20, and 21, I told you I was going to use this verse today. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, and from the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You have the power of death and life in your tongue, and God wants you to declare that over your life. You are what you think. The battle for your mind is a vicious war that Satan will do everything in his power to win. But you can win it. Meditate on the Word of God. Claim that God is a God who delivers you. Take some things off. Put some things on by declaring the Word of God over your life. You declare it. You believe it. You say it. And when you do that, God's going to bless you. Listen to James 4, 6, and 7, and I close with this but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You want to be transformed in your thinking? You want to overcome that stinking thinking? God says, you can resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And we do that by thinking about what God promised, by believing, claiming that deliverance in our life, and by declaring God's Word to be true and declare it by faith in our life. When you do, you're going to begin to change your thinking. Repentance, it means to change your thinking. It means to think like God, and you're going to change everything in your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to obey the Word of God today. We let it into our life. We ask that you change us. And Lord, I I pray now that you would just help it to accomplish exactly, Holy Spirit, what you want it to accomplish. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, those of you joining us online, let me talk to you for a moment. There may be some of you that need to receive Christ as your Savior. You want to do that, then you admit to God that you need Him. You can't do this on your own. You're not good enough. You never will be. But Jesus is, and He died on the cross for your sin. And you can say something like this to God. God, I pray that you'd save me. I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I pray that you come into my life today. And God promises that if you'll ask Him that, that He would answer that prayer. Uh, Last week, we had somebody pray online and receive Christ as their Savior in our service. Maybe you want to join those today and do that. Click the button at the bottom of the screen to let us know that you receive Christ. If you're in the room today and you want to do that, take the Next Step card, put your name on it, check that you uh, receive Christ today. No matter who you are, uh, we ask that you do that. Maybe there's somebody that you're here for the first time and you want to start that relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, For our football players visiting today, I know that you guys go to a Christian school. I went to a Christian school, graduated from a Christian high school. But just because you go to a Christian school doesn't make you a Christian any more than just because you go into a garage makes you a car, all right? You become a Christian not by the school you go to, but by the Jesus you follow. And so I would encourage you, many of you already are saved probably, and I've heard very good things about you. And I'm very excited about what God's going to do in your life this, this year. But don't leave here today without knowing for sure 
that you've received Christ as your Savior. I'll be around to talk with you if you'd like to talk or if you want to fill that out. You say, I pray to receive Christ today. Fill that out. Drop it in the drop box on the way out to my right, to your left, and let us know. Whatever your next step is, I encourage you to take that, whether it's going through our next step class, whether it's joining a small group, which will start up next month again, or whether it's uh, getting involved in serving.